1 Kings chapter number 18, we'll read the first verse. We'll have prayer and we'll jump right into it this afternoon. 1 Kings chapter number 18. Brother Randy, that's in the Old Testament. <laughs> Aren't you glad you can joke with Bible believers? You know? Anybody have any good bald jokes? Just let me know. I like it. I like it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, 1 Kings chapter number 18, verse number 1. The Bible says, And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. Pastor Kim, Jean Kim, would you pray for us, please? Amen. My we saw glimpses of heaven. It is such a blessing. But we will not be able to continue to see your glory unless our hearts, they, those veils within our hearts, those sins within our lives, the blindness, that they'll be cleared by the preaching of the word of God. Yeah. So I continually beg and pray for the Holy Spirit to yeah. continue moving. Yeah and to work upon our hearts and our minds and help us to see ourselves in this message. Things that we need to change, things that we need to get right with you. Or if there's nothing else, things that we can keep in our hearts so that we can use it better for your glory. Now fill within your speaker, your power, your spirit. May the words that come out of his mouth be something from me and not from you. May our ears be open yes, and to be attentive and to know it is from me and yes. not from Pastor Walker. Yeah. Lord, move. Move upon the sermon and the heart. Yes. Yes. This is now your work, Father. Now move in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. You may be seated. First message on Elijah, we dealt with the trials of our faith. And we talked about the reality of trials for God's servant. When you serve the Lord Jesus Christ, just expect that you are going to have trials. The reality of our trials. Well, yesterday we talked about the trust in our faith. And this has to do with the risk. The risk of simply taking God at His word. And there are risks involved. But today, as we look in 1 Kings chapter 18, I want us to talk about the triumph. The triumph of our faith. The reward, the reward for standing up for God. Now you'll notice in verse number 1, the Lord tells Elijah here to go show himself to Ahab. Now previously, he had told Elijah to go and hide himself. And now after three and a half years, the Lord says... You go and show yourself. You see, a day of reckoning is coming. It's a time now for Elijah to cross over the line. It's time for him to say, I'm coming out of the closet. Yeah. It's time for him to cross over the line. Yeah. It's time for him to stand up and be counted yeah. and to say, you know what? I don't care what all the other preachers say. I don't care what all the other churches do. I don't care what the politics are. I don't care what the preferences are. I'm going to stand up for the Lord God Almighty. It's time to show yourself. Now let me go ahead and say this. If you can't lift up your voice and praise God on top of the mountain with an influence of Bible believers where people are encouraging you and pushing you in the right direction, what are you going to do down the mountain? What are you going to do down in the valley? What are you going to do when the pressures come in? It's time to show yourself. It's time to cross the line. It's time that Christians come out of the closet instead of hiding in the closet. It's time for us to be able to triumph in our faith. And there's a reward for serving God. I wouldn't trade anything I've ever done for the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing. 
Now, I would trade a lot of things I've done for myself and things for the flesh, but I'd never give up anything I've done for Jesus Christ. It's worth it. It's worth it. So here we have the triumph of our faith. And what a great chapter this is in 1 Kings chapter number 18. We're going to read some amazing things. But we need to understand as we think about our faith, sometimes we always paint a dark, bleak picture. And look, we want to be realist. This world is not getting any better. Like I mentioned, some of you younger people here, maybe you have some dreams. Maybe you have some goals. Maybe you have some things in mind and you want the nice little house and the nice little white picket fence around the house and you want a couple of kids and a dog in the yard and you want all these kind of things and it might not happen. You know, seldom does life turn out the way you envision it. But you know what? Sometimes we always focus on the negative and we focus on the times getting darker and they are. And the darker it gets, the brighter you can shine. Things are getting dark, and the church is pretty much losing. You know, we're losing the battle, but by the message today, we need to understand we're going to win the war. Amen. Hey, I'm on the winning side. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. Yeah, we have some trials of our faith, and yeah, we have some testings, and we have some hard times of our faith, but there's a triumph of our faith. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. It does pay to serve God. And you know what? If you stand up for Jesus Christ, there's a day of reckoning. There's a day when he's going to stand up for you. And he'll take sides with his children. And he'll stand up for you. So I want to preach about the triumph of our faith today. And I want you to understand that it does matter that you serve God. You know, faith is the victory. That's what John says. He says, we overcome the world by our faith. Elijah's life is a life of faith. And if anything, Bible believers, we should be living a life of faith. Now, I want you to notice, first of all, in the first couple of verses, the conflict of our faith. The conflict of our faith. You see, really, when you look at this and you think about some of these things, it's really the past circumstances of this conflict that give us the history. It's not about Jezebel versus Elijah, or Ahab versus Elijah, or the false prophets of Baal versus Elijah, or the false pagan religions versus the true religion of God. It's not really about that. It goes further back than that. Way further back. The most powerful being outside of God. And by the way, there's only one God Almighty. Amen. Sometimes I think in theology we get a little loose with things and we say, well, you know, you have heaven and hell and you have God and the devil. Hold on just a second. Nobody is an opposite with God. The same energy it would take for God to lift up this handkerchief, it's going to take that much energy for him to destroy the devil. The devil is no match for God. God is the omnipotent God. He's the almighty God. There's none other like him. The devil's no match for God. But the backstory of all of this is that the devil himself, as the anointed cherub that covereth, he rebelled against God. And the backstory where we find ourselves. You see this line here, and I guess you could hang, a, hang a, uh, a screen over it, and you could have a play, and you could have people behind the stage getting things ready, and then they could come out, and then you would see what's going on. But behind the screen, there's things going on. You know there's a whole lot of things that have taken place before you were ever born? Not just in church history, not just with things that have taken place in our country, but even further back than that. You see, the devil himself started a war with God. That's the backstory. So really, I know we're focused on ourselves. I am the biggest selfish person in the world, and don't look at me like that because you are too. Bunch of rascals in here. Amen. Bunch of hoodlums. Y'all use that word in California, hoodlums? But we're selfish. We actually think it's all about us. 
The devil's coming after me and it's all about me and, and I've got to fight and I've got to do this. It's a whole lot bigger than you and me. This camp's a whole lot bigger than the preacher's the pieces of flesh that stand up here and try to preach. This camp's a whole lot bigger than the little jars and the pots of clay that stand up here and try to sing. This camp's a whole lot bigger than all the work and all the money and all the time that goes into it. This camp is a whole lot bigger because it represents the Lord Jesus Christ. And this battle's a whole lot bigger than you. There's a battle, the past circumstances, it's between Satan and God. But you'll notice here in the text, he, he, said, he tells him to go stand in front of Ahab. And so we have the present cause of the conflict. And we know what's taking place in the land. You'll come down to verses 17, 18, 19. It came to pass, verse 17, when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, and that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. That's the present cause of the conflict. They're worshiping Baal instead of God. The mistake in verse number 17 is that Ahab is blaming the wrong person. The reason God turned off the water is not because God was being mean and it wasn't because Elijah was a bad prophet. The reason God turned off the water was they were worshiping Baal instead of God. And can I say that sometimes the Lord will, be, will use very practical things in your life to get your attention. The Lord knows how to get a thorn and stick it in your flesh and push. And then you realize, oh, I've been giving Baal attention instead of God. I've been giving myself attention instead of God. I've been putting all these other things. What does the Bible say? Thou shalt have no other God beside me. Anything you put just a little bit above God, whether it be your family, whether it be your friends, whether it be your finances, whether it be your foes, what else you, whatever you put above God becomes a false God. And so God will do things. He'll turn off the water. He'll put you in a circumstance where you have to look up. And Ahab was blaming the wrong person. He should have been blaming himself as the leader of the nation. He should have been blaming his wicked wife who brought in that idolatrous religion. And he should have been blaming the results of worshiping a false god. But instead, he wanted to blame the preacher. And you know what? All you have to do is halfway serve Jesus Christ and people are going to blame you. People are going to look at you. They're going to pick on you. You don't have to wear a signboard and walk around. You just halfway serve the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll stick out like a sore thumb. Job chapter 37, he mentions the weather. Verses 11 to 13, you don't have to read it, but he mentions how that he uses the weather and he says he causeth it to come whether for correction or for his land or for his mercy. And so the present cause of the conflict is what they're doing. They're worshiping Baal instead of God. Now here's what's happened. The past circumstances meet with the present conflict, and here Elijah has this battle pushed upon him. And here we are, brothers and sisters, in the last days. And this battle is in front of us. I'm looking at the last generation, I believe, before the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. The battle's upon us. What are we going to do? The conflict is here. Look, I don't believe in starting a fight, but once the fight gets on, they start it, you finish it. That's how it ought to be. Amen. And so the, the conflict is here. It's time to exercise your faith. Exercise your faith. Three and a half years. Elijah's PBI training. He went a semester ahead of time. He probably didn't opt out of the English courses. That's probably what happened. But now he's ready for the conflict. Some of you, you don't think you're ready, but God's ready to put that faith to a test. Now let's look at verses 3 to 16 here. Notice the compromise of our faith. We have the conflict of our faith, but then we have the compromise of our faith. Notice in verse number 3. And Ahab called Obadiah, which was the governor of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. For it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah took an hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. 
they didn't get any in and out burgers. <laughs> and Ahab said unto Obadiah, Go into the land unto all fountains of water and unto all brooks. Peradventure we may find grass to save the horses and mules alive, that we lose not all the beasts. So they divided the land between them to pass throughout it. Ahab went one way by himself, and Obadiah went another way by himself. And as Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him. And he knew him and fell on his face and said, Art thou that my lord Elijah? And he answered, I am. Go tell thy lord, behold, Elijah is here. And he said, What have I sinned that thou wouldest deliver thy servant into the hand of Ahab to slay me? As the Lord thy God liveth, there is no nation or kingdom, whither my Lord hath sent to seek thee. And when they said, He is not here, he took an oath of the kingdom and nation, that they found thee not. And now thou sayest, Go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here, and it shall come to pass, as soon as I am gone from thee, that the Spirit of the Lord shall carry thee whither I know not. And so when I come and tell Ahab, and he cannot find thee, he shall slay me. But I, thy servant, fear the Lord for my youth. Was it not told, my Lord, what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord, how I hid an hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water? And now thou sayest, Go, tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here, and he shall slay me. And Elijah said, As the Lord of hosts liveth, before whom I stand, I will surely show myself unto him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. Now here's, a, here's Obadiah. He is a carnal, corrupt comp compromiser. That's what he is. John chapter 10 describes a hireling. A hireling is not really a shepherd. A hireling is just somebody, he's kind of like a, 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 a baby, uh, instead of a babysitter, he'd be a baby sheeper. <laughs> He's just somebody that comes in to kind of fill some time for the shepherd. He really doesn't care about the sheep. He's just an hireling. He's just paid. Instead of a calling, it's just a career. You see, he looks at it from a monetary viewpoint. How much can I make preaching? A Bible-believing pastor doesn't have a salary. He has an offering. Amen. Now I know as far as tax purposes and all those kind of things, you might have to do that. But you know, that's how we word things in our church. Our church, they give me a love offering. Amen. I don't have a career, I have a calling. Amen. It's the ministry. But Obadiah, he's one of these compromisers. He's one of these career-minded guys. He's one of these hirelings. He can be bought. He can be purchased. How come he's not in the cave? Notice the position of compromise. Notice the position Obadiah is in. Now look, you don't have to be a preacher to be an Obadiah. You can be a church member and be an Obadiah. You can be in a Bible-believing church and be an Obadiah. Notice his position, verse number 3. He's in between all of these fears. Look in verse number 3. He fears the Lord. That's what it says. Verse number 7. He fears Elijah. Man, he sees Elijah and all of a sudden... His knees get to sh shaking. And you can tell from verse number 12 and verse number 14 there, he fears Ahab. His position, he's always scared that he's going to offend somebody, and he's always scared what everybody thinks about him. If you're going to serve Jesus Christ, you've got to get over what everybody thinks about you. The fear of man bringeth a snare, the Bible says. He's a compromiser. Notice the position of compromise. He put himself in a position where he could not be used and couldn't stand up for God. Now you'll see some signs of compromise right here in the text. Notice his allegiance. His allegiance, first of all. Uh, obviously, we can tell he's with Ahab. Why is he not with, with Elijah? How come he's not pouring water on the hands of Elijah? But he's with Ahab. Notice his allegiance. Elijah straightens him out. In verse number 7, Obadiah meets him, and he says, Art thou my Lord Elijah? Elijah corrects, corrects him here. Look what he says. And he answered, I am. Go tell thy Lord. Obadiah, I'm not your Lord. I'm not your master. Ahab's your master. Just go ahead and call it like it is. 
You're using these Protestant churches. You're using these false Bibles. You're using Roman Catholic Bibles. Let's just go ahead and call it like it is. Amen. Amen. Compromisers. His allegiance, you'll see that. And then notice his actions. He's treating the symptom instead of trying to find the real problem. The real problem is, instead of out trying to find grass, he should be on his face repenting. And he should be trying to get Ahab to repent and trying to get the nation to repent and start serving God again. But instead, he's out trying to find grass. You'll notice the uh, signs of compromise. So you see his allegiance, you see his actions here. But then notice the pride of compromise. Look in verses 12 and 13 here. Was it not told my Lord, verse number 13? He goes back and he says, hey, he goes, look, Elijah, uh, didn't you hear what I did? And he begins to talk about past victories. Hey, it's, it's a blessing to do some things in the past, but past victories can't make a present success. He's just trying to live off the past. And he's trying to boast himself in what he did for the Lord. I fed these men with bread and water in a cave and I protected them and I kept them alive. And didn't you hear about that? Elijah doesn't care about that. His pride. The pride of compromise. Let me ask you this question. Are you a used to be? Here's the idea, and it's been real good preaching from these guys. The idea is that we're in love with Jesus Christ when we get saved, and rightly so, but oftentimes if we're not careful, our love waxes thin, and our love grows cold. If we're not as in much love with Jesus Christ now as we were then, then we're used to be. If we're not as fervent in our faith as we are now as we were then than we're a used to be. It's not just about how busy you are and how active you are. It's about how your heart is in love with Jesus. Obadiah was a used to be. He's a compromiser. And so not only do you see the conflict brought before us, we see the compromise of our faith. Because here's what happened when the battle's brought before you, you always look and you can take the option to try to mediate. To try to compromise. Let's just try to get along. It's a Christmas get together. Let's don't ruffle any feathers. It's Thanksgiving. It's the holidays. You better make up your mind. You better draw the line. You can just miss Sunday this day. I mean, it's a family get-together. Family reunions always take place on Sunday. We're having a vacation. You can skip church just, just this weekend. What's the big deal? Or a little more subtly, the devil whispers in your ear and says, you don't have to read your Bible this morning. You're a little too busy. You don't need to spend time in prayer today. Just a little compromise. Brethren, now is not the time to compromise. And now is the time to dig in. Now is the time to put the bowling shoes aside and get the cleats out. Dig in. And get ready for the conflict. Notice verses 9 to 12, the presumption of compromise. Obadiah, he is a double-minded man. And you know what the Bible says in James? A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So now Obadiah, he is full of presumption. He's thinking, oh, if I go tell Ahab Elijah's here, then all of a sudden Elijah's going to disappear because God can hide Elijah and nobody can find him. And then I'm going to go tell Ahab and then I'm going to get in trouble. Notice when you get into that whole compromise and deal, you become unstable. And you think you're being very intellectual and you think you're just weighing your options and you think you're trying to play it safe and you think you're really being spiritual like Obadiah. I think he would consider himself a very spiritual man because had not he compromised, those hundred prophets would have died. Bob Jones Sr. said it's never right to do wrong in order to get a chance to do right. 
And see, that mind, you'll begin to go and justify your sin and justify your compromise, and then you're filled with presumption, and you make all of these options because of your fears. And here's Obadiah worried about what's going to happen to him because it's all about self. If you are a compromising Christian, you are all about self. It's all about self instead of sacrifice. A Christian that will triumph in his faith is a Christian that will present him his body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. But a Christian who compromises will just be selfish and focused on himself. And that's Obadiah. He's a compromiser. Instead of facing the conflict, he compromises. Now let's look at the contest. Here it is, verse number 19. Ahab and, Je- and, uh, and Elijah meet, and uh, Elijah says in verse 19, Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal 450, and the prophets of the groves 400 which eat at Jezebel's table. And so Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, Not a word. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. So here we find this contest. Okay, It's going to come to a head. And it's interesting, when you read the book of Revelation, And you get over to the Battle of Armageddon, which shows up about three times in the Scripture there. And what you find is, toward the end of the tribulation, the Antichrist and the false prophet and the armies of this world that choose to take the mark of the beast and worship the Antichrist, they know they're fighting against the Lamb. Now right right now, currently, I believe unsaved people are blinded. There are some people that are genuinely deceived. They think they're serving God when they call Him Allah. They think they're serving God when they pray the rosary. They think they serve God in the false religions. But they're blinded. They're deceived. It's up to us to turn the light on and to show the glorious gospel of Christ so they can see the error of their ways. But there's coming a day when people are going to know what they're doing. And there'll be a full recognition. It's a day of reckoning like here. The prophet's good on one side and Elijah's on the other side. It's clear. You know, the lines to me are kind of getting drawn in the sand. Things, especially out here, it all starts over here in the great land of California. And it kind of moves over to the east. Takes it a while to trickle down to Florida. However, America really is just one big city. It really is. Everybody's connected. And what you see in our country today is through things, I think, really going back about 2020, you see an exponential push to choose sides. Yes. Uh, yeah. And the devil's very uh, uh, clever in how he's doing this thing because the idea is to make it to where you look like the bad guy when you're really the good guy. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, and bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And so that's the devil's trick, but he wants you to try to compromise and meander around to try to make things work. They're not going to work. I'm not trying to tell you to be rude. I'm not telling you to wear a shirt like that everywhere you go. I like it. But what I'm telling you is there comes a day when you're going to have to be on this side and you might be the only one and 450 prophets of Baal are on the other side. And so be it. If that's the way it's got to be, that's the way it's got to be. I'm just telling you, the way things are moving, you better be ready for the contest. Let's look at the rules in verses 22 to 24. He says, look, verse number 23, give us two bullocks. Let them choose one bullock for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on wood and put no fire under. And I will dress the other bullock and lay it on wood and put no fire under. And call ye on the name of your gods and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. You see the rules. Well, what happens? Verse 25, Elijah says, you know what? I'll let you go first. Be my guest. 
And he lets them go first, verse number 25. Choose you out one bullock for yourselves, dress it first, for you are many. And call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under. And they took the bullock, which was given them, and they dressed it. Now that doesn't mean they put clothes on it and shoes and socks and all that kind of stuff. I hope you all understand that. Some of you hunters know what I'm talking about, but I just want to clarify the archaic language in the King James Bible for you. And they dressed it and called on the name of Baal from morning, even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. So you see what's taking place here. Verse number 27, it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awaked. The rules are laid out, and then as they do their thing, you know what Elijah does? He gives them a rebuke. I like Elijah. I told you before, people mistook the Lord Jesus Christ for Elijah. Jesus didn't walk around like this all the time. Bless you. Bless you. Jesus would point his finger and said, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites! You make one proselyte, you make them twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. He was a preacher. He says, you're the blind leading the blind. One time he's preaching and there's huge multitudes there. And the only reason they're there is for the, the freebies. They just want the goodies. They're ready to hear a great message so they can get all the freebies. And he says, I'll tell you a parable. A sower went out to sow and he threw some seed over here and it did this. He threw some seed over here and it did that. He threw some seed over here and it did that. And he threw some seed over here and it did that. See you later. The disciples are like, Master, you kind of left something out. Declare into this parable. Tell us this parable. He says, hearing they hear, but they don't perceive. Neither will they understand. He says, I'm not going to tell it to them lest they be saved. That's judgment. That's a rebuke. He watches their heart. Elijah knows the heart of these men and he rebukes them and he makes fun of them. Let me go ahead and say this. I'm not advocating. I have to preface everything because we're already crazy. But let me tell you this. When a Jehovah's Witness comes to your door or a moron, I mean a Mormon comes to your door. Sorry about that. When they come to your door, don't let them intimidate you. You intimidate them. Yes. You say, hey, before we say anything, let's have a word of prayer. Come on. Yeah. Lord God Almighty, in the name of Jesus Christ, by the power of your blood, I rebuke these devils. And I pray you give me power in the word of God. And you do that for just a few minutes and see if they're still there. That's good. What I typically do, I'm just real honest with them. I say, sir, ma'am, you are in a cult. And if you believe what you believe, you're going to die and you're going to burn in hell forever. And you're teaching a false gospel and this guy here that's only been in it six months, listen guy, you don't need to listen to this idiot. He made his own Bible so he can teach his own lies. You don't let them intimidate you. You stand up for Jesus Christ. There's a time when there's rebuke in order. There's a time when you kick them and you go ahead and kick them. Now you've got to have discernment. You've got to have grace. But Elijah, man, he knew when to kick them. Amen. And he's making fun of them. Yeah. Praise God. What's your God doing? You remind me of Micah in the book of Judges. Whenever they stole his little priest, remember the Baalite religion there? Yeah. It's the first time you really see it rear its ugly head from Nimrod way back in Genesis chapter number 10. This Baalite, this, this uh, religion is there because Micah gets him a young man and he says, I want you to be my priest and I'm going to call you father. And I need some idols, and you're going to have idols, and we're going to worship. Well, those Danites came in, and they stole their priests. They stole the images. They stole the idols, and they took off. And Micah, when he overtook them, he says, you, you took all my gods. What do I have left? That's exactly right. All they have is a man-made religion that worships the devil. They don't have anything. They don't have the true God. 
Look, you've got the right Bible. Amen. You've got the right beliefs. Amen. You've got the right Savior, the Amen. only true God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Don't be intimidated. Amen. Sometimes a rebuke is in order. He lays down the rules. He lays out the rebuke. And he makes fun of them. And rightly so. They begin to cut themselves. Verse number 28, you see this in modern day and age, and it's so sad. It's so sad to see people, they don't even know what they're doing. They mutilate their own flesh. and That's what's taking place here. They're trying to get Baal to hear them, trying to get Baal and try to get some kind of reaction. They prophesy until the offering of the evening sacrifice. There's nobody that listens. Verse number 29. Then Elijah says, verse 30, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. Do you know before people get close to God, sometimes they're going to have to get close to you? God's going to use you to bring them to the Lord. Somebody said it well. They said the only Bible that some people read will be your life. I mean, Half of, you, half of you might not be reading your Bible. You think people out there are reading their Bibles? They don't read the Bible. They don't know the Bible. They're going to watch you. You say you're a Christian. They're going to watch and see how you react. They're going to watch and see how you deal with things in your own life and how you deal with conflict and how you deal with the wickedness of this world. If you laugh at the dirty jokes, if you go along with the field, they're going to watch you. Elijah says, come near. Are you comfortable enough? Are you close enough to God? Are you ready for this conflict where you can say, hey, come here. And you're close enough to God and you're standing before God so you know even though they're all evil, even though they get close, it's not going to get on you. Do you have enough of God for it to get on them instead of their demons getting on you? He says, come near. Come near. Unto me, he says. And all the people came near unto him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Verse 31, Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar, as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put... The wood in order, and cut the bullock in pieces, and laid him on the wood. And Elijah said, Fill four barrels with water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And he said, Do it the second time, and they did it the second time. He said, Do it the third time, they did it the third time. Three times four is twelve. Representing the nation of Israel. Notice the repairing of the altar. The repairing of the altar. It says in verse number 30, He repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. How's your altar today? Now, in the Bible, we read about the altars, like with Noah when he came off the, um, well, first with Abel, you know, in his sacrifice. And by the way, there are seven times, we're going to see it a little bit later on, but there are seven times in the Bible God answers by fire from heaven. And we know Abel had an altar that he put the lamb on for the sacrifice to be made. We know when Noah got off the ark, he built an altar and he took those clean animals, and he offered them as a sacrifice. So we see the idea. Abraham, he came to Bethel, and he set up first his altar and then his tent. You don't build your house first and then go to church. You go to church first. In other words, you find out where God wants you, and then you build your career. Then you build your house around where God wants you. How come it's only the preachers and the missionaries that that applies to? I know you got YouTube and I know you got live stream, but you know, you only have one life to do this. Wouldn't it be good to have life in a local Bible believing church? Amen. Well, I'm going to make $2 extra an hour if I move to Timbuktu. Well, don't call me to visit you in the hospital. I'm not driving all the way or halfway around the country to go visit you. You call your YouTube preacher or whoever else you got. And by the way, let me preface all this. I know there are ex circumstances, but the exceptions prove the rule. They don't disprove the rule. If you're one of those exceptions, you shouldn't be getting offended at me right now. But if you're getting upset, maybe you're not the exception, and you need to get your blessed assurance back in church. <laughs> Amen. There's my little church plug. All right, so he repairs the altar that was built down. The altar is set up to sacrifice on. Now, this is an interesting thing as you think about the time in which this takes place. Elijah is primarily a prophet in the north, although he comes down in the south a little bit. 
But down in the south is where God said in the book of Deuteronomy, when you come into that land, you're, I'm going to give a place to put my name. And my name is going to be over that mercy seat. And I'm going to set a place where you sacrifice. And if you sacrifice any place else, you're sacrificing to devils. So what in the world is an altar doing up here on Mount Carmel? An altar of the Lord on Mount Carmel? Some of you Bible scholars can help me out with that. I came up with two, uh, two explanations. One of them may be that it is a remnant of the altars prior to the tabernacle and temple being set up down in the south. That could be a possibility. Or, I thought of this one from the book of uh, Joshua chapter 22. Do you remember when Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, when they went back over Jordan and they said, because, I mean, let's just be truthful. When you're hundreds of miles away, you're not going to come every time you, you know, think a bad thought to offer a sacrifice. There are three times a year all the men children come to do their sacrifices. So what they did is they built a big altar, a memorial altar. And at first Joshua and the princes and Phineas and all those guys, they came over, they're ready to scrap with them and say, look, what are you doing? You're not supposed to sacrifice anywhere but over in Shiloh. That's where God's altar was at first. It was there in Shiloh before he moved it to Jerusalem. And they said, hey, no, no, this is not an altar of sacrifice. This is a memorial. So maybe that's what this is here. I don't know. Your mind can just go in that. But the idea is that it represented in that area, it represented God. It was an altar of the Lord represented by those 12 stones. So where's your altar? Where's your altar? Maybe it's broken down. Maybe you need to repair it. He repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Notice what he does next. He put the fire in there and he pours the water out. Notice 34 and 35. Before he makes the request, he takes the, he has that whole place filled up. I don't think we read the verse, did we? Let's look at it. He put the wood in order. Yeah. He, he, he poured the water. Four barrels with water, verse 33, and he pours it on three times. Four times three is 12. The water ran round about the altar, verse 35, and he filled the trench also with water. So he's not going to pull out a little big lighter. That's what these people do that smoke cigarettes and stuff. They have these little lighters, you know. He's not going to pull out a little lighter and do some little trick. This thing's saturated with the most precious substance in the land, water. That's what the Lord's looking for. He's looking for that substance that is precious. Just like the ointment that was brought for Jesus, it was precious ointment. The alabaster box, very similar. Here we have the most precious substance in the land is poured out. All on the altar of sacrifice is laid. There's no doubt when the fire falls, who does the fire? Notice what happens. Here's the request. Verse number 36, it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Can I say he's not cocky, but he's confident? He's confident. You talk about a man of prayer. You talk about a man who's in the battle and in the conflict doing exactly what God wants him to do. And he's confident. Paul said being confident of this very thing. You can be confident in your faith. Notice his request. Verse number 37. Hear, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. So he's praying not just for himself, and he's praying not just for the people, but he's praying that in the end God can get the glory. In the end that the people will worship God again and say, you know what, Baal's dead. Baal never was alive to begin with. God always has been God. He always has been and He always will be. And it's about time we make Him the Lord of our house. It's about time we lift Him up. It's about time we pray to Him and we praise Him. That's the request. And Elijah, he has prayed so many times privately, so many times persistently and now God's got him in a place to pray publicly and sometimes God will have you in a place like that I've been in some unique situations before 
not the current governor, but I preached a funeral one time, and we had the governor, a couple of governors back there in the, the thing. I've had some unique opportunities and called on to pray and things like that, and I take it as a, uh, as a, a privilege to lift up the Lord Jesus Christ. God knows these fake compromising ministers won't lift up the name of Jesus. They won't even pray in Jesus' name. Instead of saying, Amen, they'll say, Ah, woman. You believe that? Uncle Bud Robinsons was an old-time Methodist preacher, and he goes to a place to have a meeting, and the meeting was, it was kind of like the time the famine in the land is dry. And so he's out there praying, he's staying with a, an old farmer, and he's out there praying in the barn, and he's just hollering at the top of his lungs, Oh God, this place has forsaken you, this place won't listen to the gospel, this place is dead, it's dry, God, you've got to do something. He's just going on and on and on. And after it's all over, you know, and he comes down to supper, and the farmer's like, uh, Uncle Bud, uh, I don't think God's deaf. And Uncle Bud says, I know he's not death, but he's a long way from this place. <laughs> he's a long ways from this place. Elijah is praying publicly to get a hold of God. So you see the request, and now we see the release. Verse number 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. The release, verse 39, the repentance. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. In retribution, verse number 40. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. The Lord, He is the God. The contest of our faith. And finally, at the end of this passage, we see the confidence of our faith, verses 42 to 46. In the meanwhile, verse number 45, you see that phrase? Look at it, verse 45. It came to pass in the meanwhile. You see, God told Elijah in verse number 1, He says, hey, I'm going to send some rain. And so Elijah does what God says. The fire falls down. The prophets of Baal are destroyed. And in the meanwhile, He told Ahab, hey, there's... Some rain coming. There's watching and there's praying. The servant's watching and Elijah's praying. He prays earnestly. Verse number 41, notice what happens. He said unto Ahab, get thee up. You need to get up. Get up. God's about to do something here. Get up. Notice verse number 41. You need to listen up. There's a sound. There's a sound. There's not even a thundercloud yet. There's not even a, a wind blowing in yet. And Elijah says, I can hear it. Man, I can hear it. It's getting close. Can I ask you something today? Can you hear it? Can you hear maybe that oil, you know, going in that trumpet and kind of getting the, the little keys ready? Maybe you can kind of hear the chair next to the right hand of God kind of creaking as the Lord begins to stand up. Can you hear it? There's a sound. You better get up. And you better listen up. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith continues to listen to God's voice. And Elijah, he listens to God's voice. God had promised that rain was going to come. And he knows the rain is going to come. You know, he's praying according to the will of God, by the way. This goes in with Brother Randy's message this morning. He's praying according. If we pray according to his will, he heareth us. Now, sometimes we don't know what to pray and we ask and we seek and we knock because we're not sure about the will of God. But when you know God's will, you pray confidently for God's will and you believe it. And you listen up. Verses 42 and 43, you look up. 42 and 43, Ahab goes, Elijah goes to the top of Carmel and he gets down on his knees. He tells his servant, you go up and you look. I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, the time of victory is coming. The time of the triumph of our faith is coming. We need to look up at the place of victory. We need to look up. You say, how do you look up, preacher? Just like Elijah did. He got down on his knees with his face between his knees. You see more on your knees than you do when the astronomers go out and look in the telescopes. You get down on your knees and you can see up. 
You look up by getting down. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God and He'll exalt you in due time. And so here you look up. You say, where do you look? You look where God's going to come. You know, I uh, mentioned funerals and things. I don't know if they do it out here, but where I'm from, you always bury them facing the east. They're always facing the east. And whenever they're bringing that casket in, the funeral director always tells me, if he doesn't tell me, I always go look because uh, the preacher always goes to the head of the casket. Because that body's looking where Jesus is going to come one day. Boy, when you think about that ground out there and the graveside and how, how uh, sad it is and how uh, 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 dark it seems, man, you're dealing with, if there's Christians out there, man, that's resurrection ground. Amen. That ground is holy ground. Amen. When that trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ are going to rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. We need to look up. Verses 43 and 44, he keeps telling that servant, he says, you need to do this thing seven times. There's God's number. Don't give up. Don't give up. Now, the end of this passage is an interesting passage because he tells Ahab, you need to, you need to go on. Your chariot's going to get stuck in the mud if you're not careful. I don't know how many dirt roads y'all have out here, but where I'm from in Georgia, they have those old clay roads, and that thing gets muddy and the rain comes down, and you can get stuck really quick. And he says, Ahab, you better go. And Elijah girds up his loins and he runs. Verse 46. And God's hand is on this man and he runs 15 to 20 miles, nearly a marathon, back to the entrance of Jezreel. I'm telling you here, don't give up. Don't give up. The triumph of your faith, the last part of the journey oftentimes is the hardest part. And you think about that race, and you younger Christians in here, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Right. Yeah. Those of you been saved 10, 20, 30 years, I've been at my church, I can't believe it, 20 years this month. 20 years. Amen. Seems like just yesterday. Amen. This thing is a marathon. We need to be in it for the long haul. And the only way you're going to last is for God's hand to be on you. The only way you're going to be able to run and just keep pace and keep breathing and slow down enough to where when that cramp comes in your side, you just slow down yeah. and you keep breathing and you just keep pace and you just keep going forward, Amen. forward, yes, forward. Onward, Christian Amen. soldiers. Amen. Don't give up. One man stood up, and as a result, the fire fell and the rain fell. The fire fell on the sacrifice, not on the people. The fire, I'll give you references if you want them, represents God's holiness. This wasn't just a lightning bolt, and it wasn't just spontaneous combustion or something like that. The stones themselves were consumed. It was brighter than the sun. And it fell on the sacrifice and not on the people. And the people were spared. And repentance and restoration came because one man stood up. And his faith was able to triumph. God will use you. Just one, just, just you. Maybe you, maybe you, maybe you, maybe you, maybe you, maybe you. Maybe you. To bring repentance and restoration through God's blessings. Lord, thank you for the text. Thank you for helping us with this. Lord, we pray that you would give us the boldness, the courage that we need. Where are the Elijahs of God? Lord, help us to be Elijahs. In Jesus' name.